what is with this weird, like, blah? In my last episode of Astrophysicist Reacts, where I reacted to the film Contact, I asked you lot to make suggestions of what I should watch next. And I've ended up with a list that is longer than my arm. And to be honest, it was a little bit overwhelming, so I've been avoiding it. That was until Joan Freeman on Twitter this week suggested a very specific episode of Stargate SG-1 that he knew I'd love because it has all my favorite things in it, like black holes and wormholes and time dilation and general relativity. That reminded me that so many of you in the comments of my last video had also suggested that exact episode. So I figured it would be rude not to watch and react to it. Now, I've never seen any episodes of Stargate SG-1 before, so I'm probably going to be very confused jumping into the middle of season two here, and I'm probably going to offend all of the diehard fans in the process as well, just like I did when I watched Star Trek. We'll no doubt predict the time of the star's final collapse. Okay, so Magneto is as concerned as I am. Never gonna live that one down, but never mind. Here goes. I was all ready for this to be like the Stargate SG-1 opening sequence, but I actually think they're setting up the episode. So I've, I've read a rough synopsis of the episode and I know that there's a planet that ends up too close to a black hole. So I think that's what they're setting up here. It sort of panned over the planet and then you saw this like binary system of stars. That's cool. Most stars are in binary systems, about 85% or something. The sun is actually very rare that it's on its own. Now there's some things that look great here and there are some things not so great. First one just being the binary setup is great, right? You've got a much denser star with like like a normal star around it and the denser star is pulling matter off the other one and using that to, to grow and add to its mass. That is what we see with binary systems. We see these bridges. We have this thing called a Roche lobe as well, where you literally get matter forming this sort of equilibrium between the two stars. One of the things I'm taking issue with is that you've got two stars here, one that looks pretty normal, maybe even it's in a red giant phase, I don't know, but then you've got a much smaller star and it's clearly shining. So if that was a star being that small, first of all, it wouldn't be that bluish bright. It would be a lot redder, but also the biggest star would go supernova first and would die first, not this smaller star that's apparently gone supernova here because bigger stars have to burn fuel at a quicker rate to resist the crush of gravity inwards. And so they ended up using their fuel up quicker and they die first. And smaller stars can burn fuel at a much more chill than casual rate. And so they don't use it up as quick and they actually live much, much longer. Like, you know, hundreds of thousands of years compared to like billions of years of life. Those are the differences we're talking about. The only way to have actually had a supernova and made a black hole would have been to have a star there that was like 10 times the mass of the sun. It would have left behind something. There was a black hole that was about three to five-ish times the mass of the sun. The rest of the outer layers get thrown off out into space in a big shockwave. And that would have like, you know, massively disrupted the orbits of any planets orbiting around that binary system because all of a sudden like half of the star's mass has just flown out and so completely disrupted uh, that system. Also like the any surface of any planets in orbit around that system. If you had a supernova like that, they'd probably get torched, right? Or the atmosphere completely boiled off. So, you know, there's, there's some issues here with this setup and also whether you would actually end up with a planet orbiting around a black hole like this. But, you know, plot fiction plays a role in science fiction as well. So I'm willing to let this go for the sake of the fiction side of sci-fi. Oh, I swear it'll be the last time I ask. But these wormholes we go through, they're not always there, right? No, sir. They can only form between two open gates. I feel like I should point this out because I feel like I'm always pointing this out, but wormholes and black holes are two very different things. So under general relativity, so which is Einstein's way of describing gravity, gravity essentially is mass curving space-time, right? And so in a black hole, essentially what you've got is this point where all space-time comes together in a little point. Almost like you've taken a funnel and, and pinched the end, right? There's nowhere to go. And there's that region around it that's that point of no return, right? Where you'd have to be traveling faster than the speed of light to escape. It's what we call the event horizon. A wormhole, however, is like two funnels back to back, right? You can actually travel in and out of it. There's no event horizon, that point where you'd have to be traveling at faster than the speed of light. They're two very different things. What's with the worm part? 
The worm thing. I, I, I don't get that. Imagine the galaxy is an apple. We burrow our way through the apple like a worm, crossing from one side to the other instead of going around the outside. I do like the apple analogy. However, my favorite analogy of wormholes is the paper analogy. Instead, do I um, do I have a piece of paper? Don't look in this drawer. This is like my Monica drawer. No, you weren't supposed to see this. It's <laughs> very crumpled up. NASA Easter pad about the James Webb Space Telescope. But here we go. So my favorite analogy of a wormhole is if, say, you've got two points on either side of space. So say this is the Earth and say this is Saturn. Everyone wants a day trip to Saturn, right? So imagine that's like two separate places in space and a wormhole essentially is like taking what is essentially flat space that is separated by a large amount and bending it so that you can essentially punch a hole between the two points of space. It's not exactly what you do. You don't exactly actually bend space. It's interdimensional, supposedly. Wormholes, hypothetical. Black holes, actually proven. I feel like I should state that as well. <laughs> computer now recognizes the signal as SG-10's iris code. That's Henry Boydstein. Why would their code be coming through so slowly? I have no idea. So if this is the team that's like on the planet around the black hole, then their signal is coming in really, really slowly and they've had to up the frequency of the signal. So that says to me that that is gravitational redshift. So you might have come across the concept of redshift before as like a Doppler shift, right? You hear the pitch of sounds change as like say an ambulance comes towards you and then moves away from you. It's higher pitch is coming towards you because the sound wave is squashed. And then as it's moving away from you, the, the sound wave gets stretched out with it and so gets stretched out to a lower pitch and, and you sort of hear that as it, as it moves towards and moves away from you. The same thing can happen to light as well and that's how we know that galaxies are all moving away from us because the light is redshifted and therefore the universe we think is expanding. But here what could have happened is that the frequency of the wave could have been redshifted not by the fact that it's moving but because of gravity, gravitational redshift. Again, climbing out of what we call this like well of potential around uh, a black hole, right? You get this huge stretch in the frequencies of wavelengths of light as they do that. And so that could be a reason why, you know, like the, the frequency in this code they're sending to say, hey, it's us, is, is coming through at such a, a different frequency because it's getting gravitationally redshifted shifted by the gravity of the black hole, which is cool. I like that they included that. Nice touch. Yes, sir. I love how that says molecular deconstruction. Like, I feel like that's kind of like what you think of when you think of like teleportation, like completely deconstructing every single molecule and atom that makes you up and completely reconstructing it in a, in another location rather than wormhole necessarily. Like I think you travel like as a whole through a wormhole. Um, so that's probably something that, that wasn't really necessary. But I, what I love about the teleportation, and that is very, very sci-fi, like we're so, so far away from that. That's a pipe dream, I think, for any physicist or engineer is the idea of teleportation. Um, but what I think is the most interesting thing to chat about with teleportation is almost like the philosophical and ethical like ramifications of it all. Like if you completely deconstruct yourself and reconstruct yourself somewhere else, are you actually the same person anymore? Like an inanimate object, fine, that probably is, but like if you do it with a living, breathing thing with thoughts and, and memories and, and emotions, like are you going to be the same after that? Like I think, I think that whole thing is just fascinating, which is a tangent, but anyway, I'll carry on watching. I don't understand, it's just red. There is an image here. Captain. Sir. It's possible that the image we're receiving from the probe has red shifted. So the image that they receive would not be red. So even if this probe is near this black hole, it would be like the, the, the signal they got before, which was like their code to, to get through the, the wormhole, the Stargate, right? It would be, the signal would be red shifted, but the information encoded on the signal wouldn't be so your actual image wouldn't be red right that's how signals are sent tv signals right you encode it on on a light wave say like a radio wave or something and then you have all that information on that wave and if that wave gets stretched out that information about the color about the sound whatever it is is still the same 
the image that they received from this signal that had been stretched out because of gravitational redshift wouldn't itself be red. Like you don't have like an, an image wave that can get redshifted to, to the infrared, right? That doesn't exist. So what they've shown here is not really something that would happen because of gravitational redshift. It looks cool, but it's not gravitational redshift. <laughs> See if you can play back the video transmission in real time. We need to find out. This is all we've received so far, sir. 11 frames of digital picture in the last six minutes. That represents a fraction of a second. So what's going on here? They've only received 11 frames in the past six minutes from something that's taking video at, say, I don't know, like 50, 100 frames a second, right? And she says it, what they've received is only technically a fraction of a second's worth of video. And so what's going on here is time dilation. So you might have heard of time dilation before in the sense of like, the faster you're moving, the slower time goes for you. That's something we call special relativity kinetic time dilation. Kinetic is in movement. What's going on here is something different. It's what we call gravitational general relativistic time dilation. So it's to do with the bending of space-time again, with Einstein's theory of general relativity. It's to do with the gravity of the black hole. The closer you are to the mass that's curving space-time, the slower time goes from your perspective. Whereas the further away from you are, the further away you are from the object that's curving space-time, then the faster time will go for you. So this has been proven before. It was predicted by Einstein way back at the beginning of the 20th century, but this was actually proven when two extremely precise atomic clocks were flown on two different airplanes at different altitudes around the Earth. And so one was flown closer to the center of mass of the Earth and the gravitational potential of Earth, and one was flown further away. And there was nanoseconds difference between them to the point where like the one closer to Earth had recorded less time than the one further away from Earth. And yeah, okay, nanoseconds seconds different it's tiny but they were so precise that they could actually measure that level of difference but earth is also very very small in the grand scheme of astronomical objects around a black hole that time difference would be much larger so with that you can end up with this scenario where these people who are very far away from the black hole experience six minutes and those people on this planet you know very near to this black hole very near to the center of mass very much in the space that this black hole is is curving they only experience a fraction of a second so i think it's really cool that not only have they sort of included that and thought about that as they've incorporated it but it's also going to be, I think, part of the, the story of, of them actually figuring out what's actually happened on this planet, which is, is really nice for them to include. What will happen to them? Well, sir, the time dilation is a result of the intense gravity, which is directly proportional to their proximity to the- Captain. She's explaining it to you. You just weren't patient enough. Their bodies will be pulled apart by increasing tidal forces. <laughs> Why didn't they use that word? It's the best word ever. It's the idea that you will be pulled apart by tidal forces. Essentially, the gravity is stronger as you get close to the black hole when you're further away. So if you're falling in, like, feet first, essentially, the gravity will be stronger at your feet than at your head, and you get stretched out like spaghetti in an astrophysical process dubbed spaghettification. And I... I, I dare you to say that word and not to feel happier. <laughs> I mean, not if it's actually happening to you, of course, but still. Those people are probably not going to make them happy right now. Carter, what would happen if we just pulled the plug? <laughs> Classic. Have you tried turning it off and turning it back on again? Hello, IT. Have you tried turning it off and on again? It's an outgoing wormhole. Nothing can come through this way. Except for the black hole's gravity. Now close it. That's an order. Close the iris. Yeah. So the gravity wouldn't come through the wormhole. Again, gravity or the effects of gravity are felt because the, you've got mass curving space-time, right? And that you've got the curvature of space-time of the wormhole, the wormhole, you've got the curvature of space-time of the black hole. The two aren't connected in any way. So the only way that you could be able to transfer the gravity is if there was some sort of transference of mass from the black hole to the wormhole, which is not what's going on because the two aren't connected. The wormhole brings you out on the 
planet, right? So that wouldn't actually happen. That's not physically possible. But, you know, if it did, and if a dog tags got dragged in there, I don't know how much this random metal iris thing is actually going to protect them in the long run. But, you know, every little helps, I guess. I'm hoping that someone such as yourself would come back up and confirm our hypothesis. Which is? We now know that the SPC is experiencing what is called time dilation. Time is quite literally passing slower within the facility than it is topside. Again, time dilation wouldn't be transferred through the wormhole because the time dilation they're experiencing through gravity is due to the proximity to the actual mass that is curving space-time. You've got the wormhole curving space-time, you've got the black hole curving space-time. The two things aren't transferred, again, unless you had some mass transference. So the idea that like time could be traveling slower for the people down in the facility near the Stargate to those above ground, Again, it's not physically possible. Although very useful, I'm sure, because like, you know, they're still running around like headless chickens trying to work out what the hell is going on because they've only had like 10 minutes to think about it. But up on the surface, they've had a couple of hours probably and they are like, you know, we have a hypothesis. We think we know what's going on. And they'll also probably be able to come up with some form of solution, right? They'll be able to like workshop the problem and then send someone down and be like, it's all right, we've had hours. We've figured it out, you know, stop running around like crazy people, we can we can shut this thing down and solve the problem. That would be very useful, you know, if you had like a deadline and you were like, do it some time dilation right now so I can actually, you know, write this essay or get this like data analysis done or whatever, I guess. Uh, the dreams of a physicist anyway. How are you doing, Teal? I suffered simple electrical burns on Eel. Nothing more. He'll be out of commission for a few days. Gravity waves. <laughs> I was going to say an earthquake. Like, what else could go wrong? But <laughs> gravity waves, right? The gravitational waves that we've detected are from two merging black holes, probably even bigger than the black hole they've got here. If this is a black hole that's formed from a supernova, supposedly. So it's somewhere between like three to five times the mass of the sun or something. We've detected the merger of black holes that are bigger than that, maybe like, you know, like 30 to 50 times the mass of the sun. And the gravitational waves we detect are absolutely tiny. Like the precision that the detectors need that you have over in the US and in Italy, they are, you know, so, so precise. They're detecting like differences down to sort of like fractions of an atom in diameter, like they're that precise because that's how tiny these little gravitational wave fluctuations are. A single black hole like this would not be able to give you gravitational waves that look like an earthquake, right? That's not something that you'd be able to feel. Field, but it seems that our space time has begun to warp, just like on P3W451. Will you stop that? Stop what? Explaining to you what's going on after you asked her a question? Christ. We're in trouble, sir. Thank you. So great. Think of something. Think of something. Just think of something. Like, how demanding. Good Christ, after you've yelled at her as well. Like, she's literally the person that's probably going to save you. Like, don't be a dick to her. <sighs> Jesus Christ, I'm across the Well, we gated to a planet. It's being sucked up by a black hole. Very bad. Very dangerous. Why is that? <laughs> Things tend to get sucked in. I hate, hate this idea of like perpetuating the stereotype of stuff being sucked into a black hole. Black holes aren't like the hoovers of the universe, right? They, they're just objects, right? If you replace that black hole with a star that's the same size, right? So it, say it's like three times the mass of the sun, you wouldn't imagine stuff getting sucked in towards that star because it's the same mass, it's the same gravity, it's just a different gradient of gravity. So it's only when you get really, really close to the black hole that there's the issue. So unless that planet has managed to move really close to the event horizon in that time, I know they said they were close already, but like really, like much, much close to the event horizon in that time, and bearing in mind time is moving a lot slower on the planet as well, so that's very, very doubtful. Like this wouldn't happen. Like you wouldn't have this being sucked in. Stuff mostly just ends up orbiting black holes because, you know, as stuff approaches a black hole, the extreme gravity speeds it up, actually. It gives it energy and sort of like slingshots it around it. That extra energy is enough so that the whatever it is is moving fast enough to escape the pull of the black hole. So it's moving incredibly fast 
orbiting the black hole usually if it gets sort of captured in orbit you then somehow have to make that stuff lose energy some way so usually that happens in like collisions say if it's like a gas or something you've got gas molecules colliding like balls on a pool table and stuff one molecule gains a load of energy and one molecule loses energy and so it's not traveling as fast anymore and slowly but surely it will spiral into the black hole with more and more collisions as it loses energy but that process is really really hard it takes a really really long time as well so you know it takes ages to grow black holes so stuff doesn't just get sucked in it's not how black holes works not how gravity works when you ordered colonel o'neill to wait five minutes you were really telling him to wait six hours maybe more Captain Relativity gives me a headache. <laughs> you and me both, mate. You and me both. <laughs> I'm breaking out the relativity equations in the tensors. You're gonna need a bigger blackboard, though. But it's all happening in advance of the gravity field that's causing it. Now, according to everything I thought I knew about relativity, that is just not possible. Okay, so remember I was explaining how you wouldn't have time dilation and gravitational effects like transported through the wormhole. She's basically just said that's not possible with relativity as we know it, with general relativity and special relativity. So that's kind of cool that they've almost like worked that into the show. Like it's, you know, it's not that they've just sort of like brushed stuff under the rug and used it for plot's sake. They've actually been like, this shouldn't be possible due to general relativity. Like. <laughs> I mean, if I was like there right now, I mean, I know that there's this huge dire situation going on, but I'd also be like, that's like a bed of paper. Like everything we knew about general relativity is wrong. We're finally gonna crack it. Like I'd be probably a little bit more excited while everyone else was a little bit more dire around me. <laughs> you wouldn't want me in this kind of a situation. <laughs> Wait a minute. Sir, that's it. We do use a bomb, but we focus the energy of the blast. I love. This. I, like, I'm just picturing like the writers' room when they were writing this episode, and they're like, "Right, wormholes, like it's stuck around a black hole. Like, what do we do? What have the physicists got for us?" And the physicists are like, "Well, wormholes completely hypothetical. Like, we don't really know how to make one. Never mind, close one or move one, or whatever." So they've gone. What's the most plausible thing that we can think of? Like, has anybody got any ideas? And someone around the table has just piped up with a bomb. <laughs> And they went, yeah, a bomb. <laughs> That'll do it. <sighs> oh. I mean, you gotta love it. <laughs> like, if the if the gravity is that strong, they were just saying that there was such g forces. Like, climbing up that rope would be the worst thing in the world like if you're maybe like five times your body weight imagine like being in PE again right like gym class where you have to climb the rope but doing that with five times your body weight it's what he's doing right now like it could be even more than that Jeez. Yeah, I mean it, you would have to have ridiculous arms to do that like he's not he's not doing that I can't sleep yet <laughs> you do that I actually really enjoyed that episode and I didn't expect to to be honest I thought they were gonna get a lot of stuff wrong but they actually packed in so much relativity into the show so much that like I think anybody watching this would have learned something as well about relativity and about the effects of it and I love the fact that they worked in that what was happening was not how we understand relativity right now as well and that was always worked into uh, Carter figuring out what was going on as well so I really really liked that aspect of it too so thank you so much to all of you who recommended I watch this because I did enjoy it if there are any like specific episodes of sci-fi shows that come to mind that are like this that are so like chock full of physics like let me know either down in the comments or on social media or on Twitter or on Instagram if you come across anything that you've been watching lately like let me know because I'd love to do more reactions like this like I kind of want to do Red Dwarf next like as I remember like binge watching all of Red Dwarf while I was at university when I was actually learning all of this stuff you know the foundations of lots of things in physics like relativity and astrophysics so I mean I don't remember any of the actual show though so it'd be fun to like watch it back again now I have all of that like background knowledge so if there's any specific episodes of Red Dwarf definitely definitely let me know um but for now you know thanks for watching me watch telly thanks for hanging out with me and um i'll see you in my next video 
Before we get to the bloopers, I just want to say a big thank you to this week's video sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant is a website and an app with interactive learning courses on a huge range of science, maths, and computer science topics. Now I've waxed lyrical about Brilliant before on this channel, but recently they've upped the interactivity on their courses to a whole new level. And this is what impresses me so much about the courses on Brilliant. Because you get fully immersed in a topic, right? Learning by doing, which has always been the way that I learn best. Now they have a whole course on gravitational physics, including gravitational redshift and escape velocity and a whole host of other concepts that you've come across watching sci-fi shows like Stargate SG-1. So if you want to get stuck in and start learning, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky and sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link that is in the video description down below are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for developing these amazing courses that give people like yourselves an opportunity to learn something new and also for continuing to support this channel as well. But now let's roll those bloopers. <laughs> On is actually very rare that it's on its own. And you do, you do see? <laughs> very confused as like why there's so many like just American army dudes wandering around. Like I thought this was a sci fi program. Was everybody else? <laughs> of gravity for a while. So stuff doesn't get sucked in. It takes a long time for a black hole to accrete, to, to grow. <laughs> Thank you. Touch it and put it back. Covid. Let me hear it. Stop. 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 Seth MacFarlane. I can't believe I actually thought that was Seth MacFarlane. It looks nothing like Seth MacFarlane. Although is it? This is a really young Seth MacFarlane. Was Seth MacFarlane in Stargate S? G1. No. But he was on the Gilmore Girls for three episodes and Star Trek Enterprise. I've seen any in Star Trek Enterprise. Need an episode of that too. Phineas and Verb. <laughs> but not Stargate SG1. Definitely isn't it. 